this is not a setup question or anything. Sure. So, um, 11 years ago, and this question is both to Linda as well as to Lalit. So, 11 years ago, I started an Indian restaurant. Um, you know, I took the investor approach as opposed to a passion approach, and that's the reason uh, my restaurant was not successful. Uh, I wish I had known all the things that you've talked to today 11 years ago. Um, so that tells you how important what you just said to current and uh, would-be entrepreneurs. So coming back to my question is that you mentioned that the quality of the restaurant is heavily dependent on chef, right? Um, and I have experienced that with my own restaurant too. So that kind of makes you feel like it's it's an asset that uh, you're, you're kind of hostage, your business is hostage to a person. That means they can ask for more money whenever they wanted to, which is what happened to me. Um, so I'm just trying to understand how you have solved that, if you can share that, that's number one. Number two, Linda, this next question to you is that when we wanted to go to SBA loan, no bank was willing to give us the loan purely because of the same reasons that you just pointed out. They kept asking the questions, what's your background? I said, I, I love good food, I can eat it. I'm a great at consumption, but I was never good at production. <laughs> Meaning I can't, even, I even, even at home, you know, even I can't eat my own food that I cook. <laughs> Not that I cook, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> so for, for somebody who is first time, they don't have the background, now they have the time and propensity to go work at another restaurant to get the experience. I wanted to share some examples of how you could overcome that limitation. So two part question, one to Lalit and one to Linda. Uh, let me go ahead and answer the first part. When I started the um, topic, uh, my specific area was Indian restaurants. So Indian restaurants, uh, when it comes to cooking, formula-based cooking has not been very successful. It's been successful in this country, but not really successful. Now, what that brings back is you have to, you are kind of heavily dependent on the chef. Now, how do we solve that problem and how are we solving even today, right, as we speak, even today? So what we do is we always have a backup or two who are kind of shadow trainers, right, so to say, right? You have the main chef who's doing his work day in, day out. We make sure there is always a guy who's a backup and a third backup, but then they are not chefs, chefs. We just, you call them cutters, helpers, whatnot. But come one day when you come to the restaurant and your head chef doesn't show up, the show doesn't stop. So that's, and it takes time to build it. You can't do it in a week or it takes probably six months to a year to have that kind of setup. And that's why I was telling, when you initially start a restaurant, you have to be there day in, day out, at least for the first few months to understand what it takes and everything can just stop in a day when your chef is not there. So that's, again, this is specific to in Indian restaurants and that's how we solve it. Okay, in answer to the second question, um, uh, talking about when you get in front of a lender, let me see if I'm saying this right. You get in front of a lender and you're telling them, gee, I have a lot of passion and I want to do this, but not so much experience, but I want the loan. And you want to know how to get over that reaction from the lender that goes, okay, we'll call you later. Is that the question yeah. here? Um, I think you have to turn, you have to think like that lender. And you have to think about your risk, and you want to come in, you want to lower that risk so that, that the, the bank expects there to be some risk, or you know it, there wouldn't be anything in it for everybody. The uh, rate follows risk on loans, uh, but, uh, but you want them not to feel that they're going to lose and not be paid back. So what you want to do is think of how you can reduce that risk. In one way, let's say you're going into the restaurant business and you have no experience, um, one way is to partner with somebody that has that experience or have that person that's going to be on your staff or you've got to put that spin on your story. And when I say spin, it doesn't mean make up things that aren't right. It means bring out the things that maybe they would overlook if you didn't really spin that to the top of your story. Um, so, so that would be one way. The other way was talking about franchising or licensee, that kind of thing, where there's some other support uh, for you out there. And another way 
and it can be combined with the others is that you've done your research you know what's involved you haven't exactly done this but gee you've got these things these skills that are involved in doing this so that's why part of your package to a lender is your resume where you're going to bring out those things that shows that you have the experience that will help reduce that risk and make your uh, business a success maybe you research things a lot I research things a whole lot and in fact they tease me at work they call me a stalker because when I meet people I know all about them and they go oh you're stalking us and I'll go no I'm just researching and and that's what's really important on businesses is that that research reduces risk so you go in there and you're not a deer in a headlight going oh yeah I hadn't thought about that I just have this passion and I want to have this restaurant and it's going to make lots of money and I'll pay back the loan so just kind of think in terms that's what I tell people is ways that you can reduce that risk and put your thinking cap on and 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 I think that will help a little bit you made the comment early uh, in your speech that like uh, you're mostly dependent. It's not our Indian food is not formulatory, but rather it's more dependent on, on the chef. That makes it basic. And it's not you. Just most of the restaurant people across the uh, country, even in India, says that they don't accept the fact that accept any notion of it's being formulatory. It always inclines towards the uh, you know chef side. So that makes it basically in a statement if you want to make so it's more like you know art it takes an art form rather than a scientifically formulated or something but what I believe is it's actually the other side because Indian more Indian food is more scientifically formulatable than actually a lot of other cuisines now my question is did you as like you know your pain point is like you know you identified saying like hey retaining the chef is the most important thing right but on the other side, can you ever try to step onto the other side and see, it's like, hey, can I actually form, write down the formula how he is doing and can I try to reproduce it? Have you ever tried that? Sure. Uh, all right. So I want to answer that question in two parts, right? The first part, is, it goes back to the culture, right? I grew up in Hyderabad and uh, went to do my undergrad in Karnataka. It was a cultural shock for me. Just the rice, the dal, anything that you think it's so different in Andhra versus you go to Karnataka which is probably less than 100 kilometers from where I was in the water right that exists even today when a customer walks in their priority of dal I'm just taking dal which is like the basic thing a Telugu customer asking for a dal is so different from a Punjabi customer asking whereas Gujarati customer asking so it's basically pretty much the same ingredients it's the fine tuning that differentiates the taste palettes so when we talk about customers, when we get a customer in our restaurant, you say, yeah, Gujarati customer, is that a So what that means is he knows, the chef knows. That's where, when it comes to formula cooking, let's take an example, right? You drive 35 North, you go to McDonald's on 35 North in Dallas, drive about three hours, get into Oklahoma, go to McDonald's, you know, no difference, right? Because it's formula based, and then we are so used to it in this country because everything is kind of formula based. And that's why if you go, when you go fine dining, fine dining restaurants, any restaurant in this country is, is kind of the taste changes from a regular restaurant. So uh, again, following up on your question, have you ever tried to formulate? We have done it for certain items like biryanis. And that's why you see most of the Indian restaurant that start restaurant, they focus on biryanis. It's pretty straightforward. Biryani is something that could be formulated, but when it comes to different entrees it really changes based on the taste palette and th that's why I mean with my experience I still think uh, it cannot be generalized 100% or formulated 100% definitely I don't know what percentage it could be formulated but definitely there's a percentage that could be formulated thank you I have a question for each one of the speakers today. <clears throat> uh, first of all, once again, thank you for taking your valuable time 
to be among us. Uh, Lalit, question for you. All Indian restaurants, especially metropolitan cities like Dallas, only targets Indian community. If you take all other ethnic, like Mexican restaurants, any other ethnic groups, they have wide acceptance from local community, white, white, black, or typical American. Why not Indian restaurants penetrating into the mainstream? Uh, that's one question. And then, uh, Miss Linda, on the loan side, um, I mean, I know today's topic is only restaurant side, but SBA traditionally, you said uh, guarantees loan for new business owners, uh, somebody who doesn't have enough financial backing or uh, a good reputation or something that SBA backs him up for the loan. Is that correct understanding or I'm glad I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up and I may I've tried to condense what I was saying into such a little, little format but um, no SBA loans are not only for startups but that's the most one of the most popular reasons why a lender would consider doing an SBA loan and not be able to make that loan without SBA guarantee but no, we do a lot of SBA lending for existing businesses to help them grow. And um, um, actually, it's, it's probably easier if you are an existing business. But I did want to mention that's why our program came to be anyway, because lenders were not wanting to make loans to, uh, so to small you, business. Do you guys give loans for IT startup companies like motel industry or any other? Yeah, it's, well, we don't, you know, as I said, the lender makes the decision to go forward. But uh, no, we, we uh, see a lot of those loans, actually. And we do see a lot of restaurant loans, too. Uh, but yeah, IT, a doctor's offices, anything. Any kind of business need can be funded with an SBA loan. Um, and uh, as long as you're a small business and there's different, you know, I, I would assume that everybody in this room is going to be a small business. The, the formula for what's a small business has gotten a little bit larger over the years so that we could help even, I, I think, we didn't pass the rules, Congress did, but at any rate, um, as long as you're a small business, there are certain things that we can't fund and uh, one of them is, uh, and I didn't go over that because restaurants don't really fall into that, but um, speculative businesses, businesses that have pornography involved, businesses that uh, aren't businesses, nonprofits. There are a few nonprofit loans that we can do. Um, well, but we, we can come to you, T. We're looking for funding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, um, I didn't ask which category, but. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so at any rate, but there are, certain, there are certain limits that we have that we can't fund through an SBA loan. When I said speculative, like house flipping, that's uh, but we do pay, uh, we do support businesses that are in the real estate field. Um, uh, but if you're building spec homes and you don't know, you're not building it for a certain person and all that. But I can get into more detail on all of those um, at that other workshop. But I want to to draw you back to that resource guide, right in the middle is a matrix of all of our programs. Your your goal is not to learn all of our programs and walk into the bank and say, this is the loan you need to be making to me. But it gives you an idea. It gives you an idea. Really, it's a chart for lenders, though. It's a, it's a good chart for lenders because there's so many of the, 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 the programs out there. But that just gives you an idea of the kinds of things that we can find. We, we find real estate. Um, if you're starting your business and you want a real estate loan, this 504 program is fantastic. It has as little as a 10% um, equity in in the project by the you know uh, uh, investment by the business, which is very low for um, uh, real estate. And it has a fixed interest rate and all kinds of things. So just about anything that a that a business a small business would need, we we could help through an SBA loan. And I'd love to do that full-fledged program where we can go into all the nuances of that. Mr. Simone, a uh, question for you. <coughs> uh, I guess you guys are experts in franchise industry. So this question actually to both Lalit and you. I haven't seen any Indian restaurant that trans 
transformed into a franchise industry. Why can we do that? Uh, what are the challenges? Can you help Lalit to make him as a franchisor? So, uh, yeah. So I was actually I was I was waiting for the the other guests to answer. I can I can see the similar question going around here on the twofold uh, formula funding. So I I just want to clarify a couple of things because today, as a guest speaker, I was invited to talk about the food and beverage. Actually, um, as a banker, I get to know every single industry and understand all the funding components. I just want to highlight a couple of things real quick uh, to, in terms of SBA. Let me clarify this: you must go to the lender. And the lender is mitigating its own risk through SBA. So what the lender is doing is saying, well, if Mr. ABC does not pay me, how am I going to get my money back? And so this is where SBA comes and says, I'll cover his tab up to X amount on the uh, cents on the dollar. So versus doing a conventional loan, which is with his own money, he's still doing the loan. He's still executing funding the loan, collecting interest on the loan. But if something goes bad, he looks at the government and says, you need to cover the, the risk that you said you would. So I uh, want to make sure that that's understandable. SBA is not executing the funding of the loan. Neither the lenders are. So you still must go to the financial institution, adequate financial institution for it. Some financial institutions choose uh, to full, uh, abide by the SOP guidelines of the SBA guarantee. Some do not. And this is kind of where the challenge of the first question. So it all depends on the financial institution if they want to obey 100% or 80% or 50% of the instructed guidelines of the SBA program to where they want to apply and be in. That being said, uh, as I said, I came to talk about food and beverage, but uh, we finance everything, hotel, motel, gas station. Uh, we have a really good niche in the hospitality industry uh, with my partner, Emron Memon. So if anybody like that industry, well, we are obtaining a tremendous amount of funding through the SBA uh, in that industry and also uh, at all type of funding. Uh, Recipe specs is the proper word if you want to say in the food and beverage industry for the franchise formulation that I keep hearing. The recipe specs, and this is where if you're going to go ahead and say, I want to be in the food and beverage industry, I want to put some money in and figure it out. What this man has done here, I personally, I'm talking as a banker now, risk mitigation, I would not go that route. I would go the franchise route because the franchise route will tell you how to go from A to Z from a production line through these recipe specs in order to output product. I hope that makes sense. So therefore, you don't have to go to your mama's kitchen kind of recipe. They give it to you, and you have to obey this. And if you're a good operator, you can execute over and over and over again, and then you can grow within the franchise organization. The last question, which is how come uh, the Indian food uh, recipe spec franchise license has not been in mass population? To tell you the truth, I think that it's happening. It's it's the next food right now. I'm, I follow a lot of the trends and the financing going on, and somebody eventually is going to come and do it, which they're going to say, you give me, you know, here's my mother's recipe spec. We put it in a formulation. Here you go. This is the brand. Here's your logo. Here it is. I'll train you. I'll coach you, and then off you go. It, that's coming. First, there was not a, uh, it, did not be, uh, it was not done before, to answer your question, because of demand. And exactly for the reason you said, the this particular niche is only targeting its own, for lack of a better word, where the Hispanic and the American food have opened up the doors to everybody. I think as other cities that are more affluent, uh, Miami, San Francisco, Los Angeles, they've already crossed that barrier. I think Dallas, Texas, being a conservative state, is now starting Dallas because of the great migration of people coming here, is starting to get there where the supply and demand is there. So if our maestro here doesn't do it, somebody's going to do it if it's only a matter of time, guys. I, I, it's just growing at a rapid pace. I mean, I'm not going to talk about myself. Um, coming from Argentina, I only ate steak and chicken and maybe a little pasta. And because of being in the funding industry of hospitality, especially, I come to meet a lot of you know people from Gujarat. And then the staffing, I finance a lot of staffing. So Hyderabad, is that how you say Hyderabad? Get to me that. And so you're starting to realize that you got to try it, you got to try it, you got to try it. Now, this man sitting here in front of you eats every day Mediterranean food, uh, Indian food, I've just opened up the, the palates. And so I think that the state of Texas, being the conservative state, has taken a while, uh, a longer time than the other states. But it, it, it's, it's a matter of time. I mean, we're talking about a month or maybe this year, somebody's going to pop it and make that happen, the franchise concept of Indian food. Again, going back to your question, uh, I want to answer again in two parts, right? The first part, if an average family comes out for dinner, 
there are five choices and not in a particular order the number one choice would be American food where they get steak or burgers one of the choice the second choice would be Mexican food Tex-Mex Mexican food the third choice would be uh, Italian place you get a pizza pasta whatever right fourth is a Chinese place you want to be a little adventure and then the fifth which is kind of a little more adventurous is sushi like the way we look at these are the top five cuisines when an average family goes out and eats the taboo with Indian food Indian cuisine Thai cuisine are perceived to be spicy food got to be very cautious kind of approach that a general uh, you know population has so what that does it it puts pressure for an average Indian restaurant to penetrate into that market so what we do is we have a pie of Indian or when I say Indian it's all the South Asian ethnic groups that anytime a new restaurant opens in town we always try to get a piece of the pie and every restaurant owner always talks about him and how do we break this and get it to the mainstream if you have tried it but it's not been that successful but as um, you know Ramon put it it also depends on which city you are in like cities like San Francisco I was in Bay Area for you know we went to school in Bay Area but Bay Area it's it's more open I mean you know average family is more open towards Indian food because they go out to lunch with their colleagues they get uh, you know they like the taste kind of thing but when it comes to conservative states like tech and even if you go to Midwest it's, I mean the inner you go into the country it gets even more harder to run and operate and Ohio I can understand you brother 11 years back it's a tough job right uh, so how do we do this so one of the ways again is uh, going back to the first question is probably if we do a formula based kind of a milder which is more acceptable that's what we call uh, Indian American kind of flavor which is more milder more cream sauce probably we could penetrate but then again, you know, everyone is trying to get there. Just to piggyback and add something to that, and the industry clearly uh, is in this particular segment needs it. A long time ago, uh, and we talk about Mexican food because we're a border state, Arizona, California, but if you go to the Midwest, it took a while, same process to penetrate. Um, eventually, people in, in Texas figured out to do the Tex-Mex niche and made that mainstream. So. It almost, and this is a personal opinion coming from a banker finance type of guy, but just looking at the operations of the business, somebody needs to bridge the hybrid of American Indian kind of, you know, a Texas Indian food and with a palate where it's not too spicy or not too, you know, f uh, what's the big ingredient? Cumin, not a lot of cumin. And so then that way they could be uh, um, available to the, to, to the palate. And at that point, you would see the change and migration of clientele, hopefully, to, to grow and be able to do a franchise concept. Yeah, my name is Rajiv. I am the CFO of a company over here. So I'll be more on, on the finance part. First question will be to, to Simon and the other one to Linda. Um, one of course what Mr. Srinivasan asked about regarding if you do anything other than FNB which you have already answered. Now my question is in what sort of a stage should people come to for any, any new entrepreneurs should you come up at the time of initial idea when there's a concept in their mind they come back to the finance to get the financing done or when the whole structure is ready that time they should come because at both the stages the the decision making sometimes may change at the initial stage or after the concept is already done I may have passion I may have a lot of stuff with me but my most important question is going to be whether that passion and the uh, the intent has that backup of the finance so should that be done at the initial stage or the later stage and coming to the next part would be uh, to Linda uh, when you say guarantee is there any specific industries that you prefer uh, SBA prefers to work only with or it is like pan all the industries it's of course other than what you have already mentioned that you're not going to work but still there is always a preference so knowing the type of industry where, where food and beverages are what is your normal preference of what you see normally so uh, to answer the first question, that's a really, really great question. And it goes back to, and I'm going to go back to the story of uh, our maestro here, which is I might have passion for food and beverage, but that doesn't mean I know real estate. That doesn't mean I know uh, 
QuickBooks, accounting, doesn't mean I know uh, taxes, doesn't mean I know all these other things. So to answer your question, when do you come for funding, the logical thing would be whenever you have your product put together and you're ready to go to market. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people do not know how to do the surrounding things to go to market. And so um, the firm that we have with Imran, which I, I, I talked about today, we can consult from A to Z into that whole pro aspect. So you can come either, hey, I got an idea, we'll sit down, we'll talk to you, and we can find a way to monetize it. Or, hey, I already did all the bells and whistles, took it from A to D, now I'm just waiting for gas in the tank, and I need some capital, and how do we go upon doing that? So there is no right answer of the when, because it all depends on the individual and where they're at and, and the aspects of knowledge of all the surrounding things that it has to take place to run a business. Passion is the number one we talked about because it will make you endure all the tough times. That's the real down. If I have to simplify passion, it's because you will push through everything with passion versus if it's just an investment, like eh. And so that's a different concept. So if, 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 if somebody feels that they're ready for funding, we can wait until then. If they just want to know, hey, I'm thinking about this, how do I go upon approaching it? We can consult and advise on that and work through the process, which would be the path of least resistance. Some people know that information, some people don't. So the, the timing will be contingent upon the knowledge of the person. So to answer the second one, which is a totally different concept here, and that's about um, asking if the SBA preferred one kind of business over another for the purpose of the guarantee. Um, no, we, we don't. Remember though, and uh, Simone was trying to relay this to you, and it's, it's kind of a different concept that people don't get just right away. But we don't really make the loan. As long as you meet our, our standard operating procedures, and this is one that we can fund, we leave that up to the lender. They're in the, the business of figuring out if that's a risk that they even want to be, because even if it's 85% guaranteed, that lender's still taking 15% of the risk. And even if it goes into liquidation, they're still involved in a lot of tasks that, that go with that. So it varies by the lender. In general, uh, many lenders are uh, they're reluctant on the restaurant industry. That doesn't mean they don't make great loans to the restaurants, but that's a real reason. My word, you've got someone in front of you that's not afraid to loan to the restaurant industry. So Simone, we actually, we as, as speaking uh, on, on behalf of the federal government, we don't care that you get the SBA loan or uh, over getting another kind of loan. We want you to get a loan. We're the lender of last resort, remember that? So if you can't find a Simon out there that, that can work with you, um, bring up to your lender, well, what about that SBA loan program? But you want to follow what those preferences are for that lender that you're going to go see. And it's hard to find out ahead of time what those preferences are. But that's why if you don't have any other leads on who to go talk to about a loan, and you go in and you see one lender and they're not real happy, don't stop there. Don't give up. Go to another one. They may just be trying to balance their portfolio. Um, they already did three restaurants this month. They're not going to do another restaurant right now because uh, they need to, to kind of balance their risk. There's a lot of behind, behind the, the, the scenes on that, but it's really the lender is making that loan. Now, there's a few lenders that um, actually are more of institutional. Uh, there are nonprofits with us. They borrow. It's micro lenders. It's small loans up to $50,000. They borrow from the SBA and then lend those out, but then those micro lenders can make other loans as well. We just we just care as the government that small businesses are getting loans, and so we want you to hook up with with a, a Simon over here, someone like that. And my goodness, he knows the restaurant business. You're high you're high risk all the way around. Your startup, your um, your restaurant and some of you don't have experience in the restaurant business so he he's made loans all day long every day for a few years right so he knows if that's going to fit with with and he has a number of lenders he's working with and it's not always an sba loan right it's always great if you can do it without it but we're here because the lenders weren't making all the loans all the time and there were some that they would have made if someone else was in there uh, coming up with that insurance policy, which is that guarantee. But you got the guarantee. I'm glad that that is, is it's kind of a weird concept to really, to really fathom. But it's really no different than 
FHA is to home mortgages in terms of it's a guarantee. You want to add to that, Simone? Yeah, uh, it's government, right? So they can never discriminate an in industry to answer your question. Always, no matter what the answer today <laughs> would have said, I would have been looking at to see what she was really going to say. But uh, ultimately, the, the, the real reason for SBA is to mitigate risk to the lender. So the client for the SBA is the actual lender. You're the client to the lender. Does that make sense? So all they're here is just to provide a product to, to sustain. And so lenders have categorized risk. After 250 years, probably some, you know, well, Wells Fargo, I think it's 250 years or whatnot, they'll categorize risk by the amount of liquidations that they had to do in their portfolio over all this time and then say yes or no. This does not mean that you're not uh, eligible for that guarantee component. It's just that the lender can still say, even though you're eligible, I don't want to be in that space. So you have to find the lender that has the product of SBA but actually wants to be in play in that arena. And that's why, going back to the original question, the hunt may take you know forever. And it's like the red October. You have to just keep going and going and going and going. Or then you can find companies like ourselves and Imran, which we just narrow it down because we do it every day and we already know what it is. So that's the, your two kind of the two-way street that you have right there. Hello folks, uh, this is Chaudhary again here and I was trying to ask a couple of questions. Uh, one for uh, the folks here who can answer on the SBA loans. Uh, what's the size of the loans that uh, SBA offers and uh, what's kind of interest rates or some things that you know, people want to look at you know, when they want to you know, get open to some new things? Uh, that's the first question and uh, what is the guarantee that uh, the, the SBA looks into to get these kind of loans? Uh, that's one question to these uh, gigs here. And another question I have for, uh, for folks in the restaurant experience, you know, we came to US uh, to, you know, get our dollar dreams and also, uh, you know, part of the, of the community and, you know, part to grow their community, American community, and part, part of the community itself. So did we ever try in any of these restaurants, you know, uh, like locals giving the opportunity to teach or train the, uh, the, the food techniques, how to make them and taste them? And was it really successful in any of these uh, restaurants around here? Uh, if there is anyone can put some light on that, that'll be grateful. Thanks. Okay, that was quite a question. Now I'm getting back to the guarantee portion. What was the guarantee question again? I was trying to understand, like you know, what's the guarantee of like in anything else that you take? Oh, the percentage. Yeah. You know, it varies by um, the 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 term of the loan and the size of the loan and all that. You're talking about the guarantee fee. I will say this right now, we're having a sell on SBA loans. Um, up to 150000 there's no, we're waiving the fees, not only for the borrower, but for the lender as well. And then if you're a veteran, we can uh, waive more of the fees um, further, um, not all the bank fees, but, but um, more of the borrower fees and we can it gets into so many specifics um, but basically the entry a lot of the, the most of the SBA loans are variable right now through the 7a and it, they look at prime which is 3.5 right now and then it depends it from two and a quarter to 2.75 on top of that as the max but it's still up to the lender to set that interest rate we don't tell them we just tell them what the maximum is and um, so at any rate, you want to add to that since you're actually, he's actually making the loans. I'm talking about the loans. He's making the loans. So I'll, I'll let you talk to him. So the, the, the SBA has different products. Um, so to not complicate it for the, uh, the, the arena that we have here today, which will probably every 95% of the people would fall into that if they apply for it. It's a 7A product. So what happens there is that they're going to guarantee 75 cents on the dollar to the lender. So if you default, 75 cents gets covered. The 25%, the lender's kind of out of pocket, which this is quite typically the lender then asks you to put 25% down, which is kind of hilarious because that's called 100% secure. And I'm like, okay, I want to borrow money like that too. So uh, that being said, uh, the lender then changes a little bit the aspect of it and just maybe requires 10% and he's only going to be out of pocket 15. Your rate, uh, three and a half is prime and that's what they have to cover the bank so anything that they make on top of that is a spread you're going to look at around six percent typically on an sba loan is where you're going to probably play on and it's going to really depend on if you have assets or not uh, because sba does not 
The loans that the lender typically do for 7A is because you don't have assets. Consider asset or piece of real estate, um, equipment. Typically, if you do a, a restaurant, you're going to lease a spot and just equipment and some finish out to paint the walls, put the bricks on the floor. And so if you don't pay, nobody come and can take out the cabinets and they'll paint from the wall, right? So they're pretty much it's unsecured. And this is why they need the 75 cents on the dollar guarantee because that's something tangible that the bank can have. Uh, the second question, not because I don't understand the question, I just couldn't hear it. So I don't know if you could repeat the second question I can hear. Yeah, you know, we were here to, you know, uh, come and, you know, make our dollar dreams and uh, probably, you know, be part of the community uh, and then, you know, grow the community. In fact, you know, with the Americans, fellow Americans, be part of them and uh, enjoy their community and treat, you know, give our community uh, things to them too. So in respect to this, you know, like, you know, when we have these restaurants business in general, uh, we are talking about chefs and, you know, a requirement of a good chef in a location. Uh, you know, why are we still talking about, like, you know, here we are like 80% of, of the customers or like American customers who come to the, we are looking at 80% of the American people around here, 20% of Indian customers coming into our places. So, uh, we are, why are we not able to train the existing people, I mean, Americans here, locals, to give the training of these food techniques and how to uh, make this food and how to get these uh, things done properly and able to train them how to taste it properly to get the quality of the food and uh, why can't they uh, why can't the locals can catch up on this and and is there any restaurants around here who are able to do successfully and uh, i just want to get some ideas about like you know how these guys are doing in their restaurants is it clear right uh, again um this is kind of an extension to the first question we had where it again talks about a formula where there's a manual you have a list of 50 or 20 things that you do step by step to achieve a product right that has always been a challenge are people doing it yes are they successful to an extent again it's just the learning curve and uh, understanding getting to that perfect you know probably TV was not made in the first iteration it took a couple of years or whatever right similar to that right I know it's a weird example but <laughs> it's we are in the process right we are in the process and that's the that's where we want to be we want to target the bigger chunk of say you're talking about 80 percent that's where we want to be as a business because we want to make more money we are, I mean today was like a charity right but <laughs> we are in business to make money and then we are in the process of doing that So when um, I'm naive to this lender process, so what the, what's generally the profile of the lenders are, are those banks or investors or who these people generally are? And um, kind of a second question or link to that question, you have mentioned you have to go search for lenders. Where, how do we start the search? Okay. so. It all, and I'm going to go kind of piggybacks off the other uh, question there. So it all depends on where you're at in the process. What industry, what are you trying to accomplish? Is it a startup? Are you going to buy an existing business? Are you going to generate? You don't have you already generated for two years and now you're looking to make a big boom because you landed a big client. There's so many variables that there's not one square box where we can say this is what you do. Right, so and so that's unfortunate, but actually it's actually a good thing actually for you too because what it creates it creates competition and not monopoly. So therefore, there's a couple of tiers of capital. So you have private equity or you know Reg D, which is family and friends pass the hat money. Right, that's your first one. Right, so hey, you give me a little bit of money, I'll get a little piece of the business. Then you have a finance company, which he's going to mitigate his risk, and you're going to pay quite a bit of interest. It's almost better giving it to your family member, but you can then at that point say, I want to hold the company, not give up equity, and I want to go ahead and have a high interest loan. That's a finance company, typically. And then you have your tier one, which is the cheapest form of capital, which is your banking. 
And so banking is the cheapest form of capital today, that especially with the interest rates being so low than they were many years ago. So that being said is now when then you go to the cheapest capital, which is what everybody tries to search for to benefit their own selves, you have to realize that not every single lender has the same criteria and it's no different than not everybody has the same appetite for the same restaurant, right? So some people want burgers, some people want Mexican food, some people want Indian food. So the lenders are exactly the same, especially the banks. So knowing what bank wants what is, you know, it's going to be a tedious process of knocking on doors and just having the conversation. Or you can divert to companies like ours where we just pretty much do the shortcut for you and say, this is where we're going. And so that's your kind of your options. Now, if you want to do it yourself, it's just knock doors, ask, sit down with the banker and say, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm trying to accomplish. What do you guys do? Go to the next bank, do the same thing, same thing. There's nothing that has been streamlined in that industry because it's constantly evolving and changing. So banks today are doing something and then not even in 12 months, we should not shift the paradigm. They switch over completely to something else because they overloaded, and what Linda was talking about, that particular one aspect. So there was a, a lender that we did a lot of hospitality with, hotel, hotel, hotel. One day, no more hotel. Now we're moving over to staffing. Boom, staffing, staffing, okay, we're done. Now we're moving over. And so it's a constant moving target. And for a business owner who has passion that just wants to run the business, it's almost in my mind, this is just an opinion, to just go ahead and say, hey, you do this, right? I'm good at cooking, you're good at serving tables, you're good at hosting, everybody has to play a role, and this is where you can outsource that uh, to, to your ability. Also, no different than, and I heard there's a group here, CFO. I don't have a CFO, I'll outsource. So the, it does not change for the banking industry, but if you do the stack of capital, Equity, the most expensive of all because they're taking you know a piece of the business. Finance company, it's not equity, but it, the interest is almost feels like it. And then you have banking. And so the three tier. And where you fall is all going to be mitigated on risk and appetite of that particular uh, lender, finance company, or equity partner. Does that answer your question? I hope so. Yes, very, definitely. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for asking the questions.